I guess first I'll start with what's new. We had a successful site review in 2019. It was a good team. They gave us a lot of uh, help, helpful advice. And it was the first site review uh, I think we've ever had as a site that was not somehow marred by hurricanes or government shutdowns or um, nor'easters. So I'm going to uh, talk about a lot of things that I think are somewhat uh, familiar after Karen's talk. Um, for our system, sea level rise is one of the major drivers of our system. We're a salt marsh, but unlike the Virginia system, we're a fairly high elevation salt marsh, and our vegetation is dominated by salt marsh hay. We have a fairly high platform relative to sea level. Well, both the measurements and the modeling we've been doing suggest that what we're going to see as the future um, plays out with increased sea level rise is loss of overall marsh area but we think we're gonna survive into the next century, but we're gonna see a marsh that's much more dominated by low marsh, uh, which is characterized by Spartina alterniflora, much like most of the southern marshes. So the question is, what is going to be um, the impact of all of this in terms of biogeochemistry and in terms of animals? Um, and I'm, I've got a whole bunch of names here, um, and as always, this is, this is the work of many, many people. I'll, I'll try to remember to give them credit. So we're taking an approach very similar to VCR in that we're looking at a space for time type of substitution. We have six sites, um, three high marsh and three low marsh creek sheds. So these are areas dominated by patents or by alterniflora drained by a single creek. And we've been making a variety of measurements in these to try to understand what will happen as the system changes. We have two eddy flux towers, one in a high marsh and one in a low marsh sites. And then we've been doing Chamber measurements of gas fluxes, we've been looking at primary productivity in the creeks, lateral fluxes of constituents in and out, um, and doing things like taking long-term uh, cores for long-term carbon burial. I'm gonna give you just a few highlights of some of the things we found. Um, a lot of this work is worked by um, Nat Weston and his students and Inca Forbridge. Um, in terms of inputs and outputs, it's probably not unexpected, but what we see is the low marsh areas take up much more nitrate. They're much more efficient at removing nitrate, and they also trap more sediments compared to high marsh areas. But somewhat surprising to us is we didn't see really large differences in the net carbon storage between these two systems. We expected the low marsh to store more carbon. Um, what you're seeing on the bottom there, can, can you see this here? Um, you see low marsh versus high marsh, and this represents both tower and uh, chamber measurements. And we don't see a very large difference in carbon storage. But this was data taken in 2016 and 2017. Um, Inca tells me that last year, we think we did see a fairly large difference between the high marsh and the low marsh with the low marsh storing more carbon. Um, I'm, I'm, I can't quite, can, is this obscured on your guys or can you see this? We're able to see what you're, what you're referring to there, Anne. Okay, so there's a, there's a graph here that shows the carbon uptake over five different years. Um, two of those years have hours on, arrows on them. Those represent drought years. And you'll see that the difference in carbon storage from one year to the next can be more than a factor of two. So there's a lot of interannual variability and we think it's gonna take us several more years to really sort out whether we're seeing a difference in carbon storage between these two different elevation types. Finally, the other thing that might be going into the biogeochemistry that we're just starting to look at is David Johnson's been working on the migration of the fiddler crabs north. Um, fiddler crabs have just come into these marshes in the last seven or eight years or so. Fiddler crabs are a burrowing crab which um, like low marsh habitat and, and other marshes have a significant impact on the, some of the biogeochemistry. So we'll be looking at their impact as well as this vegetation change. In terms of the animals, um, a long-term experiment on marsh fertilization by Linda Deegan uh, led to the observation that we were seeing a lot of cracking by the creeks. Um, this might've been accelerated by the nutrient addition, but it's now something we're seeing widespread in, in Plum Island. And the question is, what is the impact of this sort of change in geomorphology on the animals? Uh, Jimmy Nelson and uh, Justin uh, 
Lesser, his student, have been looking at this and did a sort of certain nice series of experiment that shows that when they, these cracks are present, these fish are afraid to go up on the high marsh during a flooding tide. And that has a really large um, impact on their ability to gather high protein food sources. So the high marsh area here is dominated by what Justin calls terrestrial play, terrestrial prey, which I consider just kind of icky things, um, spiders, ants, and all those sort of things. But when the fish come off of this high marsh, their guts are packed with this high protein material. And that's not the case in these cracked marshes. So we think this could have a fairly significant impact on uh, the fitness of these, these little fish, which serve as important food resources for striped bass. Jared Burns is looking at uh, this in a slightly different way. Not only will the marsh change in terms of high marsh versus low marsh, but it will change in terms of distance from creeks and distance to upland. Unlike the Virginia system, where we have some places for marsh migration, it's going to be somewhat limited. We've got roads and other barriers. So as these marsh systems get closer and closer to these roads with more and more open water, how is that going to change things? So Jared set up a whole series of plots where they're making measurements of invertebrates, um, plant diversity, and bird use. And finally, we have individual studies of different organisms. Um, we know there's going to be both winners and losers with this change. For example, the snowy egret really likes some of these shallow ponds and pools, and it will probably do very well. Whereas the salt marsh sparrow down below here is an organism that is an obligate nester in the high marsh. And as that high marsh area disappears more and more, and as it gets closer to closer to the road with more disturbance, um, it's really going to be in some trouble. Um, I'll end with just a couple highlights and challenges. Um, we completed a coastal seas project with GCE in Virginia, and I think um, a lot of papers are starting to come out of this. One of the most interesting findings, I thought, was that across these systems, even though all of the communities uh, have economic benefit from the marsh, a lot of the cultural benefits were ranked very, very highly and very similarly. Um, the other thing that is came out of sort of getting together some of the long-term data with some work by Will Walheim and his students. This shows the total sediment flux out of the watershed. And you can see we've seen a very dramatic decrease over the last 10 years or so. And for a system which uh, can help survive sea level rise with external sediment support, this wasn't good news. Um, we unfortunately don't have measurements back much before 2006, but Will has noticed that this great decline uh, it was accompanied by a large decline in runoff. And there sort of seems to be some kind of cyclical, cyclical pattern here in both precipitation and runoff. So we're anxious to see whether this is going to increase again. Climate projections for our area suggest precipitation should be increasing and whether this suspended sediment will come back up or whether it has to do with some sort of um, change in, in the watershed. There has been obviously more development. Um, I won't go into the details, but this is some work by um, Jen Bowen students, and it shows what I think is a really pretty cool thing, although I'm obscured with my own picture here. But you should see sort of a large orange area here, um, which corresponds to an area where we see a lot of nitrate reduction, but we also see a lot of carbon fixation. And that suggests we might have a um, have developed in this particular experiment a lot of chemoautotrophic uh, denitrifiers, which um, we're going to look into a little bit more. Um, I'll just kind of end with both the, the challenges, um, which I think some other people have mentioned. Um, we're very interested in seeing how sediment deposition affects marsh processes. There's a lot of management. Um, suggestions that actually adding and spraying sediment onto marshes will help them grow. Uh, Nat proposed some experiments along those lines, but we we're having a lot of trouble getting any permission to do any manipulative experiments in our site, um, and that includes disturbance measurements with the LTER cross-site comparison uh, project. But we did have a big nor'easter, which picked up blocks of ice and did deposit sediment all over the marsh, so that is turning out to be a natural experiment for us. And finally, like all the rest of you, um, 
Our challenge is going to, this summer is going to be education. We have a very active education program, both with Liz Duff at Mass Audubon and um, working with the Gulf of Maine Institute, but we've pretty much had to um, cancel most of our student-related activities for the summer. Thank you. Thank you, Anne.